our next uh, speaker uh, is Jen Bam. Thank you for being here. Um, so uh, Jen's paper is, uh, has this title, You Made Them Equal to Us, Using Psychology to Examine Religious Resistance to Animal Rights. Um, thank you, Gillian. Um, yes, yeah, so you have made them equal to us. Uh, you probably recognize that as a quote from one of Jesus's parables. And I'm going to use psychology as a lens through which to look at specifically uh, resistance to animal rights amongst Christians. And the primary reason for that is because most uh, research on um, religion and morality and psychology and religion is done with Christian participants. So that's where most of the data sit. Um, so we need to start with the question, is Christianity opposed to animal rights? And in fact, there are several studies that have shown that uh, Christians, particularly more conservative Christians, are less concerned about animal welfare than non-Christians are, and also are more likely to be opposed to the idea of animal rights uh, than non-Christians. And so this raises this, this question of, is it because animal rights is in effect making them equal to us? Is this denying the uniqueness of humanity that we see uh, in scripture in our caring of the Imago Dei. We heard yesterday a little bit about the theology of dominion and how this is often blamed for Christianity's uh, negative interactions with uh, the environment and with our fellow creatures. Um, I think Ava very briefly mentioned Lynn White's 1967 paper, The uh, Historical Roots of Our Ecological Crisis which uh, focuses on this concept of dominion theology, human beings being given dominion over the rest of creation as the root of the harm that particularly Western Christian uh, cultures have done to the environment. And of course, in the gospels, we have Jesus saying, you are of more value than the sparrows or the birds. Um, but there are different ways of interpreting both uh, the idea of dominion and what Jesus says uh, in the Gospels. Um, dominion, of course, as I'm sure we would all agree, does not equal domination. Dominion is the exercise of God's rule on God's behalf. And uh, the Christian belief is that God's rule is one of love, gentleness and care. So that is what dominion should reflect. And uh, if you've ever studied closely these passages from Luke's gospel and Matthew's gospel, where Jesus talks about uh, are not two, sparrow, uh, two sparrows sold for a penny in the market and you are of more value than the sparrows. Um, this is often taken as Jesus basically stating outright humans are more valuable than other animals. But if you look closely, Jesus doesn't say this to the crowds. This quote comes after Jesus has drawn his disciples away from the crowds and he's speaking specifically to them in the context of you're going to have a mission and it's going to involve danger and persecution, but don't worry because God is looking after you because you are valuable effectively because they have a very specific God-given task. So we shouldn't jump to the conclusion that Jesus is saying all of humanity, you are more valuable. This is Jesus speaking to his apostles in a very particular context so we shouldn't overgeneralize. So is it just that underlying theology or is it how we experience religion in the context of church that influences our interpretation and our understanding of concepts like dominion? Uh, psychology studies of religion have in fact shown that religion has many positive aspects uh, like promoting pro-social and altruistic um, behavior. However, the flip side of that is uh, it's also been shown that a lot of that pro-social and altruistic behavior uh, is directed towards one's own uh, co-religionists or one's in-group, not 
that's not exclusively the case. Uh, some studies show that actually uh, Christians uh, show more generosity to outgroup members than other people do. But uh, Galen, for example, looked at these studies of pro-sociality and questioned whether it really counts as pro-sociality because it's mostly focused on the in-group. Although others have said, well, pro-sociality is pro-sociality wherever it's directed. Um, but why this emphasis on in-group? Well, uh, religious activity uh, promotes social bonding within the group, uh, as uh, Dunbar suggested first in 2010, and has more recently by, been demonstrated by uh, Sarah Charles and her colleagues. Um, through the ritual acts that happen when we come together for worship, uh, and there's some of the things that facilitate this social bonding are acts like singing together, moving together in synchronized uh, action. And of course, when you develop close social bonds, that can heighten the awareness of being part of this in-group and therefore create a greater in-group, out-group distinction. In addition to that, I'm just going to briefly introduce you to uh, moral foundations theory, which has uh, gained some traction uh, over the past oh, decade or so, I guess. Um, developed by uh, Jesse Graham and Jonathan Haidt uh, in the US. And they look at most uh, Western philosophical discussions of morality and notice that it focuses on uh, caring and justice. And we heard uh, justice uh, as a mor moral value in Celia's very excellent talk yesterday. Um, and they said that doesn't explain everything that people think are morally uh, important kind of issues. So they propose those, that there are those individualizing foundations of morality, care and justice, but that there are also binding uh, foundations of morality, respect for authority, the importance of purity, and importantly for our discussion today, group loyalty. So they call these binding foundations because they look to the well-being of the group as a whole, rather than necessarily just the well-being of the individual. Animals, I think, are the ultimate outgroup. And again, this was touched on a bit yesterday, why that might be. Well, as you can see, just from this array of images, they don't look like us. Some animals do, primates look a bit like us. Uh, and if you believe some people, if you own a dog long enough, you and your dog start to look like each other. Um, but they don't resemble us. In some cases, they look radically different, kind of unrecognizable. You might even think they were alien species. Um, they don't behave in the same ways that we do. And we sometimes find their behavior mysterious and perplexing. And uh, as we also considered uh, in some of the talks yesterday, even if uh, you accept that certain species of animals do have language and linguistic ability or proto-language, um, it's not a language that we can tap into. They can't speak to us. And there are questions about their uh, cognitive capacities, if they can engage in uh, rational thought abstract conceptualization, imagination in the way that we do. So we class them as an outgroup. And uh, as we heard in the Gallant lecture last night, uh, that animals as the ultimate outgroup is often used to dehumanize other humans and put them into an outgroup category as well. So how do we break down that in-group, out-group divide? Um, the studies have shown that one's moral expansiveness, that is the degree to which a person is willing to include uh, distinctively different others within um, moral, their sphere of moral concern, um, predicts willingness to sacrifice uh, their own self-interest for the interest of others. So for example, uh, sacrificing uh, financial self-interest 
to benefit someone else. And that includes non-human others. Um, however, moral expansiveness, that degree to which we include others in our moral circle or moral sphere, negatively correlates with those binding foundations that we saw on these a couple of slides ago, authority, loyalty, and purity. And uh, unfortunately, uh, one of the things that Graham and Height and their colleagues have found in their research is that religious individuals tend to emphasize more strongly those binding foundations than the individualizing foundations of uh, care and justice. There's something about religion, probably something bound up in that social um, bonding that causes uh, or that leads to religious individuals uh, being focused on those group-centered moral concerns. So if that's the case, then perhaps what we need to do is encourage people to expand their moral circle so that even if we're still looking at the group, the group becomes bigger and more inclusive. Uh, so uh, in Laham's research, uh, one of the things uh, that his uh, research highlighted was that uh, people are more likely to have a larger, more inclusive moral circle uh, if they use an exclusion rather than an inclusion mindset, which sounds backwards, but what he means by that is that um, you start by assuming a kind of maximum inclusion in the group and then you have to find reasons to exclude certain others. Whereas an inclusion mindset is you start with a small group and then you have to find reasons to include others. Um, and people are more likely to have a larger set if, you're in, if you put them in the mindset of having to find reasons to exclude rather than to add in others. So he asks, if our goal is to expand the moral circle, then it seems a simple way of approaching this goal is to ask not why should I treat this being with moral concern, but rather why shouldn't I? Um, and Crimson uh, and colleagues uh, talk about who we include in the moral circle and said which entities we deem worthy of this expanded moral concern are largely socially and culturally determined. Um, not unreasonably for uh, people who attend church, their church group, their religious group is going to be part of that social and cultural environment in which the uh, members of our, so our moral circle are determined. I'm going to slide a little bit into uh, how we remember and learn because, of course, that cultural determination of our, who's included in our moral circle is going to depend on what we hear in the church context if we believe that uh, our religious uh, environment is informing our moral inclusiveness. So when, for example, uh, a sermon is heard or a lecture, um, people tend to remember the gist of what is said, not the actual words. Uh, so in that context, it's important to have a clear message that's being put across. Uh, Pargament and DeRosa back in 1985 did a study in which they found that, uh, sadly for those of us who are preachers, only one third to one half of a sermon might actually be remembered. And the message of the sermon might be distorted by the hearer to match their pre-existing beliefs. So if we're trying to change people's minds in the church context, it's important not just to put across our message, but also then to think about what the counter arguments to that might be and uh, state those and say why it's not that. <laughs> um, and then reinforcing the message within the social bonding context of church. So, for example, in the things that we sing together uh, may enhance our recall of what we hear in the sermon and help that to uh, become a part of our thinking. And all of that matters because we're, if we're trying to use this social 
cultural context of church to encourage people to expand their moral circle to include non-humans as well as humans. So what are the practical implications of this for churches? Well, I think first we need to change the theological perspective with which we think about non-human others so that we're getting people to use that exclusion mindset when thinking about their moral circle rather than an inclusion mindset. So presenting a theological perspective that shows that non-human animals are already part of the circle. And we have, if we want to exclude them, we have to come up with good reasons why. Um, so uh, even though Genesis 126 is that bit about dominion, if we look at the context in which that uh, dominion is given, Genesis 124 to 26 describes the sixth day of creation, wherein humans are created alongside the other terrestrial animals. We don't get our own day of creation. We're not that separate from the other animals. Psalm 36.6 also shows that we are not the exclusive beneficiaries of God's salvation plan, as the psalmist declares confidently, you, Lord, save both man and beast. And to get Psalm 84.3 uh, right, I'm going to have to refer to my notes. <laughs> um, so Psalm 84.3 even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may have her young, a place near your altar, O Lord Almighty. So our places of worship are not exclusively ours alone. Psalm 84 recognizes that even the birds of the air are welcome and have a place to settle near the altar of God. Uh, Psalm 136 uh, talks about... Uh, God's enduring love uh, to the one who remembered us in our lowest state, his love endures forever, and freed us from our enemies, his love endures forever, and who gives food to every creature, his love endures forever. So showing that God's providential concern is not for humans alone, but grouping together his providential care for the non-human animals, together with his care and saving action uh, towards his people. Isaiah 11, uh, 6 to 9 is the passage about the peaceable kingdom. We saw that lovely uh, painting by Edward Hicks uh, that Margaret showed in her talk this morning. Um, we have the wolf lying down with the lamb and the leopard lying down with the kid and the lion and the calf all together. And of course, within that, and a young child shall lead them and the child shall play over the den of the asp. And, you know, so humans and animals existing together in one community. And finally, Revelation 5.13 is the whole of creation worshipping God together in unity. So all of those passages can be highlighted to show that actually this expanded circle um, of community already exists. It certainly exists in God's eyes. And so what reasons do we have for excluding the non-human? from our circle of concern. Uh, in churches, we can also include in preaching uh, stories that draw on the tradition of the saints, not least St. Francis, who refers to the animals as his brothers and sisters, reinforcing that family unity between us and other creatures. And liturgies that include animals as part of the worshiping community. So animal blessing services, um, hymns that include uh, talk of the natural world and animals, and prayers that emphasize the unity of creation. So the Church of England Collect for Ash Wednesday uh, talks about uh, God creating everything and you hate nothing that you have made. So everything is embraced by God's love. And uh, again, the Church of England Eucharistic Prayer E includes uh, a line, um, Help us to work together for that day when your kingdom comes and justice and mercy will be seen in all the earth. Not across human society, in all the earth. Fully embracing um, the whole creation community in that idea of mercy and justice and moral concern. So I think there are some uh, 
really radical things that we can think about in the context of our churches in terms of how we embrace the reality that uh, this circle of moral concern already includes non-human animals and the rest of creation and build on that to counter that uh, narrative that has arisen from how we interpret dominion um, to really embrace uh, moral concern for our fellow creatures. Um, you spoke very eloquently and helpfully, I think, about the, um, the in-group, out-group dynamic between this human religious community and then the community of animals. But I wonder whether you might talk also a little bit about a, a sort of an interhuman in-group, out-group dynamic. Specifically, I'm thinking of, maybe particularly in, a, in an American context more than here, but the idea that religious communities are a particular social group with a whole set of social values, not just around animals, um, who might oppose themselves to potentially more left-leaning, um, more woke groups that might support things like gay rights and animal rights, um, and all this, this accumulated set of social values. Um, and so I wonder whether the kind of identity formation and group dynamic that you're talking about defines itself not only vis-a-vis -vis animals, but also vis-a-vis -vis these other groups um, and so whether some of that might um, need to come into our strategies for thinking about how to um, include uh, teachers and young a bit more. Yeah, absolutely. So that, that in-group, out-group divide very much um, can also manifest in mm -hmm. different social groups. Um, and part of that will be determined based on the teaching that goes on within the church about um, specific moralities and things. Um, but I think the same sorts of things um, kind of apply. So, you know, if we're encouraging people to think of, um, you know, what well, all of humanity carry the image of God, for example, therefore, you know, on what grounds do we start excluding them from our moral concern if they also bear the image of God just as we do? Um, and yeah, it is difficult because of course um, there is some research, I'm sorry, I don't know the, I can't cite the papers off the top of my head, um, but there is some research that shows when certain groups feel that they are under threat either physically or that their kind of values and way of life are under threat, then that reinforces um, attachment to the in-group and aversion to the outgroup. And I think, you know, as we see society changing very rap rapidly and really rapid technological change as well that feels threatening, that probably is also having an impact on how certain religious groups relate to people who are outside the group. I don't know if that really answers your yeah, question, yeah. but I hope it helps. Can I go again on that? Because I think what you're talking about is the, um, Effectively, what's the nature of the boundary drawing around the in-group? Is it, is it to be a hard boundary or is it to be a porous boundary? And there are different understandings of the way that you know, we would imagine that, sort of, um, as it were, the grace of God reaches to absolutely everybody, or, oh gosh, you know, um, this is a group of people defined by baptism, or, or by some other set of, as you say, purity indicators. But um, I guess what I'm wondering about is, so you, you mentioned things, as it were, to increase expression of, you know, beneficial texts about reaching towards out groups. Are there some things that you would think, likewise, you want to decrease expression of? So, so the kinds of ideas that would increase the sort of hardness of the boundaries. Mm. And then how do you balance that up against saying, well, okay, well, where is this body? Where are the boundaries of this body? So what, what would you want to talk down and enact down in liturgy? Do less of. Yeah, oh, that's a really good question. Um, I feel really on the spot because as a priest, I don't think that I want, you know, I don't want to do down anything in scripture or liturgy. <laughs> um, I think 
for me, actually what I would want to try and move people away from is the, the idea that um, we can't look again at certain passages of scripture and say, well, actually, have we been interpreting this correctly all along? Or do we need to look again at its context, its context within the wider body of scripture, how we understand that, um, what it means? You know, so rather than saying, well, this is how it's always been understood in the past, so that's how it must be, I think I'd want to say, well, actually, you know, have we been reading it correctly? Do we need to look again? Do we need to think more deeply about how we let that inform our thinking about, you know, other human beings um, or other animals. I mean, you know, really, one of the really difficult ones, you know, when you're trying to promote this is, well, you know, what do you do with the, you know, God clearly affirms sacrifice in the Old Testament. How do you deal with that? That sort of thing. Um, and that's another paper entirely, so I'm not going to go into it here. But, you know, it's about looking at that and saying, well, okay, what, what was the purpose of that? How does it relate to the rest of the body of scripture and how we understand God's interaction with creation? Um, thinking of the work of psychology in you know, looking at what's happening and thinking about words about being wise and being cunning. Um, Bob Newhart put it that there are some people who do not love their fellow man, and I hate people like that. <laughs> um, yeah, okay, now, the circle used to take a few more moves than that, but I think that uh, in faith circles we have to be very aware of that uh, dynamic. And I mean, there isn't a faith I can think of which hasn't been hit by it at mm. times. Um, you know, it's about being kind of open eyed and aware of some of the moves in the the game, isn't it? And uh, I think, I'm, I'm just, uh, I was reminded of that and thinking about uh, how uh, we use um, you know, the perspectives of psychology to help people to understand some of the distortion processes that yep. go on with the best of intentions. Yes. Um, yeah, so whether you think of psychology in terms of uh, you know, therapy that helps people understand themselves and their own motivations better, or social psychology, which is my area, which helps us understand how people function kind of together in groups. Um, but also, you know, there's some good theology for helping us think like that and maintain our perspective. Um, you know, if we think of a story of uh, Jesus and the woman taken in the act of adultery and his well, you know, any of you who are without sin, go ahead and cast the first stone, no problem. And of course, we all look at ourselves and go, mm, that's not me. Um, and Paul's very wide wo wise words, don't think of yourselves more highly than you ought. <laughs> you know, always that, you know, when we're thinking about um, particularly morality and how, how we think of you know, our morality and the morality of others or even our wider social group, there's a certain level of humility that's required because none of us gets it exactly right. Um, thank you very much. Um, just a quick question. It's to, it's to do with um, how we begin to influence in, in a community we think. So you didn't mention um, the possibility of children's education or refugees um, because I would have thought there would be rather more openness to widening the moral circle, especially with many children of heart. Um, have quite a strong affiliation with other animals and whether that could possibly be a, a means through which to influence some of the families or adults and so on. So sometimes people will respond to those, you know, children's concerns. So just as another way in to try and, um, and also you, <coughs> you implied that there was always, there was this strong sort of in-group, out-group towards other animals, but I'm not, I don't think it would necessarily exist from the beginning. So can you get back to the beginning in the early education before that starts to harden? Yeah. <laughs> no, that, that, yeah, that's an absolutely brilliant point. Um, I think the only <coughs> drawback to that approach, and this comes from my experience uh, as a priest in the Church of England is if you want to kind of educate 
Uh, the children, they have to be there. <laughs> and sadly, that's not always the case in our churches anymore. Um, but yeah, it's an excellent point. And actually, animal blessing services are a great way into that because a lot of families will come to that who might not come to church at other times in the year. Um, and so that act of embracing the whole family, including its non-human members, in a service and talking about the goodness and the importance to God as well as to humans of non-human animals is one way to do that in the context where children might be present in church. Karen, thank you so much for your talk, your paper, and taking all the questions. Thank you. I think it's time for lunch now. Excellent. Thank you.